battle. Lawrence, I want to just read this um, truth social post. Mm -hmm. um, do we have that from the last block? Maybe that just got taken away from me. Basically, uh, Trump has been saying time and time again that if, if there's no immunity, then every president, to Rachel's point in the previous block, then every president will face prosecution afterwards. And that always reads to me as an obvious threat. I mean, it seems to me he's saying not just, can we show that truth social post? Um, blah, 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 that must have full immunity in order to, a president will be afraid to act. I know from personal experience, even our elections will be corrupted and under siege, so bad, so dangerous for a nation, save presidential immunity. Basically, he's saying like, I'm gonna prosecute Joe Biden if I'm elected. That's the way those always read yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I wasn't reading it as that future thing. I was just reading it as the kind of dumb Trump idea about the way the world works. But you're absolutely right. He He's saying this absolutely allows me to do it. I'll, I'll do it. Um, what, what's so striking about it is that, as the court points out in the opinion, uh, one thing that matters when you say, if this happens, then this will happen. You know, I mean, what meteorology is interested in is, hey, if it comes up this way, if the track is this way, this will happen. How do we know that? Oh, because we've been studying it for 100 years. We have a couple of hundred years of this not happening. Yes. A couple of hundred yes. years. And the court was very yes. impressed. The court is, says we're really impressed with a couple of hundred years of this absolutely not happening when the presidents believed that it could. They, I mean, you can go into these presidencies and discover that, yes, Franklin Roosevelt was worried that this idea yes. might be against the law. Yes. Therefore, he won't do it. Harry Truman was worried that seizing the steel mills could be against the law, but he did it and he found out it was against the law and he couldn't do it. You know, they've always been worried about, is this against the law and can I do it? He, there's also this really interesting section, Rachel, where it's not just the history of the presidency, but they also do this analogizing to other positions. And there's a few different examples, right? Juries, right? Like jurors, we need them to make tough calls and, and use their discretion. But like, there's stuff that they could do that would be criminal in their official duty. Like if someone paid them to vote a certain way, that would be criminal. Judges, Judges have to make a ton of tough calls. You know that judges, justices we're writing for, but also judges can be prosecuted and it all seems to work out. Like members of Congress have to make tough discretionary calls about what's legal, what's not, like also can be prosecuted. They sort of go through all these other examples. Like, yeah, there's all these people that have to do difficult stuff, make tough calls about what the law is and none of them are rendered immune. Right. And there's, I mean, they, they go to, back to cases from the 30s. They go through all of those different examples. They go through all these different presidential examples that we just talked about, um, including, I mean, again, most famously, why did Ford need to pardon Nixon? It's, I mean, it says in the proclamation, as a result of certain acts or omissions occurring before his resignation from the office of president, Richard Nixon has become liable to possible indictment and trial <laughs> right. for offenses against the United <laughs> States, right? Like it wasn't something we had to like read into their state of mind. Like it's explicit in the proclamation. Everybody knows that after a president leaves office, he or she can be indicted. And that has always been baked in to what presidents have done. So this idea that it'll be a new thing and it will make all presidents afraid and timid, they both disprove it in the law and they disprove it historically and they disprove it in a way that just makes sense to the average American who isn't a lawyer who's trying to understand what's happening with this very radical thing going on in Republican Party politics trying to put this guy on the, on the ballot again. Yeah, and to that point about public audience, judicial audience, right? Because there are two throughout all this, and there's two, there's, you know, they're very frank about sort of different sort of interest at play, right? Presidential interest to act with some latitude in a difficult job, the public interest in making sure that people don't try to, like, overturn elections and foment violent coups on the Capitol, which they talk about. Now we've got this question about the public interest of this thing getting to trial. Mm -hmm. So here's the timing. They say the clerk, meaning the court clerk, is directed to withhold issuance of the mandate. That's basically the sort of possession of the case back mm -hmm. to Judge Tanya Chutkin through February 12th, 2024. Uh, and then within that period, the appellant notifies the clerk in writing. He's filed an application to the Supreme Court. The clerk is directed to withhold issuance of the mandate pending the Supreme Court's final disposition of the application, which means... It now goes to the court, which has a monumental decision, both on the merits, but also on the timing. Yeah, the Supreme Court is is faced with a, a strange one here. There, if this was any other litigant, they wouldn't take it. It just is, right. It's a yes. preposterous claim. An appeals court is dealing effectively with a completely preposterous claim. And so the only reason to take it is, well, it's presidential, so maybe we should weigh in. But they have to know 
that they're going to have seen SEAL Team 6 in the hearing, in the Supreme Court. It's not going to be one question about SEAL Team 6. Right. You know, there are going to be uh, several judges who have an opportunity to question about uh, Donald Trump's ability to have as many Supreme Court justices as he wants executed so that he can get the opinions he wants right. out of the Supreme Court and he cannot be prosecuted for that if he also executes enough United States senators right. so that he cannot Can be impeach, found guilty yeah. in an impeachment trial. Yeah, And, I, I and so there's a circus. The Supreme Court knows, oh my God, there's a horrible, stupid circus coming our yes. way. All we have to do is deny cert. Well, and it contrasts a little bit with the the, dis, the position of the case, its posture, Rachel, going forward, right? Because the case they're going to hear, hear on Thursday, they had to take, basically. I think we would all mm -hmm. sort of all agree, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they, you know, Colorado kicked the guy off the ballot. So did Maine. Other states aren't. You, you, there's got to be some, the highest court in the land is going to be the one that's ultimately going to give us a constitutional ruling on this. They had to get involved. In this one, to Lawrence's point, they simply don't. Right. And the mechanics of how that happens, though, end up being important. I mean, you only need four Supreme Court justices to say, yes, we want to hear it, which means you need I mean, you don't you don't need a majority. You only need four. It's easy to imagine then them coming up with the four, yeah. even if it is impossible to imagine them deciding on the merits in Trump's favor. And so do they want to take the case. They don't have to agree to have a incredibly radical, stupid ruling in order to do Donald Trump a big favor here. They just have to agree to hear it and then go slow yep. and, you know, hope that Trump gets elected, in which case all these cases go away. And that's that seems to me, I mean, that's I, I don't know what we should expect from this Supreme Court. It's amazing they're going to get the, the disqualification issue on Thursday and the immunity issue on Monday. Um, I don't know what to expect for them, but certainly if they want to help Trump here, they have lots of ways to do it. Yeah, and we should also say that this is this court's posture um, has been an incredibly imperious and greedy one mm -hmm. about what they get to say on what issues of public life they get to say. They have been sort of sticking their noses in all kinds of places. They've been telling executive agencies uh, that they've that they're you know that they get to say. They've been telling Congress that it delegated things called major questions, even though it's, there's no sort of constitutional doctrine. They've invented it. Uh, so they seem to be a court, at least the, the sort of conservative majority, that is very much a court that's like we're going to say. And I think that kind of sense of sort of their own kind of grandeur and importance, it's very hard for me to see them. To your point, Lawrence, I think they don't want the mess, but they also want to be the like, we're the ones who say. And they're, the, the, most, they're the most unpredictable Supreme Court of our lifetimes. Yes. I mean, particularly, particularly on the question of, of uh, precedent, which is what yeah. this entire opinion yeah. rests solely yeah. on, which is also sort of yeah. somewhat worrying. Rachel Maddow, Lawrence O'Donnell, what a pleasure to have you both off the top here. Let's really do this all it. the time. You bet. Thank okay. you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this it. is awesome. Thank yeah. you, Chris. Great. Thank you.